Great. Um, thanks. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> um, I'm Phil Niden. I uh, was among the people that helped start Curl. How many years ago, David? 25, something like that? 25 in January. And, uh, and by uh, some of the people, Phil, Phil was the person. Let's, let's uh, be clear on that. <laughs> and uh, oh, it's been collaborative all along, so it definitely is that. But anyway, it's, um, it's pleasing to see it's still going and doing its really good stuff. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to talking to folks. Um, I, gosh, it was like, it seems like it was a year ago, it probably was a year ago, and you asked if I wanted to do a, a, a presentation. And of course, given the events of the past year, it's gotten delayed, moved, and changed format and all that stuff. And um, I just picked the topic at that point about the future of cities. I had no idea exactly what I was going to do. Probably still don't today, but I'll, I am sort of really want to throw out some stuff uh, that we can talk about further. It's obviously a massive subject and it's ever changing and all sorts of people make predictions. So I, I, I thought I'd go about it a, a couple of different ways. Um, the first part um, is I'll look at some briefly at some conceptions of the future of cities and or future cities and then talk a little bit about uh, the way people looked at the future in the past. So, and the way I'm doing that is I decided I was gonna look at world's fairs and, and international expositions. So we'll have some discussion of the Columbian exposition in Chicago in um, 1893, the Chicago World's Fair or a century of progress in the thirties, the New York City World's Fair in the thirties and then the New York World's Fair in the 1960s. There's some interesting stuff there. Then um, talk a bit about what kinds of uh, impact the current pandemic has had and may have and other kind of trends. Although I realize there's so many ways of looking at this, it can come, uh, these are just a little inklings here and there. And then, I mean, throughout all of this, I mean, keeping in mind that when you think about the future and uh, look how to shape the future, and we'll talk about technology versus social movements a little bit. But I think that if you think about what Curl does and Curl has done and continues to do, um, that's part of the future, the kind of research with community organizations that are uh, actively working to not only serve various communities around Chicago and, and beyond, but also are, are shaping the future for those people, but also Chicago communities and, and looking at alternatives and different ways of doing things. That's also the future, which we tend to, to uh, miss that. So um, let me move ahead and... Um, I'll um, go through these and, and you'll have to bear with me. There be, might be some times of technology. Um, I'm not super uh, smooth with working with Zoom and other things, but so it might be some glitches here and there, especially I have a few embedded uh, videos and the first one coming up is uh, basically what I'd say is, is, one, is one conceptualization of the future, which was apparent in the 1960s. Um, let's see if this works right. All 
Okay, let me just get back here. Um, hopefully, was that video sort of jerky to you too? No, it was smooth as silk here. So. Oh, good. Okay, that's fine then. Um, so what Dave and I were figuring out, this was about 62, 63, and probably uh, is typical of um, sort of these views of the future of, uh, in a cartoonish way, obviously, of its future tends to be cities with lots of people flying around in uh, individual cars, vehicles. So although if you ever imagine what that might look like, just anyway, <laughs> we don't want to imagine that. But uh, so that, that's, that's one view. And uh, these are just a few, I just went to the internet and looked at some views. These are mostly developers and architectural firms, but looking at the future city and uh, a lot of it of late, especially, you know, probably the past 10, 20 years is worked around uh, looking at working with the natural environment, uh, human beings working with the natural environment, so integrating that into facilities and whatnot. Uh, what's sort of interesting here um, is, uh, I think I missed one. Let me go back up a second. Okay. Um, but anyway, with here, this is uh, looking at, jumping ahead here. Okay. Um, where, again, here are the, those flying things again, and people having what looks like a relatively normal um, COVID outdoor meeting today, um, but with these strange, actually rather ominous things flying by. Which, which made me think of other kinds of ways of looking at the future, uh, such as uh, uh, Blade Runner, which is rather dark and dystopian, which is another way. And uh, I mean, those are the sort of various themes floating around, but technology seems to dominate a lot of these, uh, a lot of these themes. And um, let's see, my, uh, my PowerPoint seems to be either going slow or jumping ahead fast. So. Here, I'm going to look at various World's Fairs and International Exposition. So I don't know how much people know about the Columbian Exposition. It's sort of an interesting, uh, it, you know, part of Chicago history. I also have to say in my retired uh, days in the past three plus years now, I have been, um, I've become a Chicago greeter. So uh, what I used to do with students showing around various neighborhoods in Chicago, I now get folks heavily outside of the country coming in Chicago and I show them around various parts of Chicago. And um, not that they know much about the Columbian Exposition, but uh, it's part of uh, um, what our history is. And actually there are a couple of buildings left from this, uh, unbeknownst to me before I started doing these tours, the Art Institute was the former administration building for the 1893 um, Columbian Exposition. So the exposition was for the 400th anniversary, uh, 1492 to 1892, uh, was the 400th anniversary of Columbus, Columbus's discovery of America, um, which is much more controversial today than it was then, although I'll talk about that in a second. And the attendees this is pretty high profile stuff. Now, this is Chicago now. 1893 had, we're, we're barely 20 years after the Great Chicago Fire, which wiped out massive swath of the city. It pretty much wiped out the city. And this is uh, the rebuilding. This is located uh, down toward uh, Jackson Park, uh, the midway where the University of Chicago now is. And, uh, but the attendees of this, there, there's some figure with something amazing, millions of people attended this and we're talking, you know, late 19th century. Um, but the attendees, attendees included Frederick Douglass, Alexander Graham Bell, Helen Keller, Buffalo Bill, um, Harry Houdini, Ida B. Wells, uh, lots of stuff. So this was pretty high profile stuff. It also, again, focused on technology. You'll see a slide in a little bit of uh, of lights there's actually i think competition between edison and tesla on uh, whether it's direct current or alternating current but at night it was, it was called the white city mostly because the buildings were white but also because at night it was this uh, dramatic 
uh, place. And uh, there's also a uh, interesting uh, role of, of women in this um, uh, World's Fair. I'll get to that in a second. But also to put it in more of a context, again, we're talking 1893. Well, in uh, 1886 was uh, the Haymarket, uh, well, actually, the general strike in Chicago and actually spread to the nation, which by the way, contrary to what people might want to do to rewrite history, 1886 general strike in Chicago was on May Day, was the first May Day and the origin of May Day as this, uh, what now is seen as sort of this communist holiday, a uh, leftist holiday, that was started in Chicago as a general strike for workers demanding the eight hour day. And it's taken a long time to get there for many people and some people still aren't there. And so, uh, it's looking at this stuff. It's looking at this massive immigration in Chicago. So it's looking at how, how cities really pull everything together. And so the city of the future is a city that is really um, integrating things. And, um, but it's certainly not without its, its conflict. The, the, among the designers were uh, architects, Daniel Burnham, uh, Louis Sullivan, Louis Sullivan. And uh, the park layout itself was Frederick Law Umstead who you may also know for designing Central Park among other places. And um, it, it just was, one of the descriptions was it was looking at the progress of humanity in, into civilization. Like there was, a, there was actually a, on the Midway or exhibit, anthrop, supposed anthropological exhibit, a display of various cultures, but looking at the development of civilization and obviously ample implications that American culture, Western European culture represented the civilized part of this um, evolution. There was also, you might imagine, conflict given some of the racism of the, of the um, development, uh, conflict with African Americans and uh, seen as, as racist. And there was at one point, uh, Ida B. Wells, a uh, well-known African American journalist, as you know, was uh, urged a boycott of the, of the exposition. Although Frederick Douglass, who was also involved, urged participation. And uh, they had actually what was referred to at that time, a color day. Uh, that was one, one way of trying to address this. It obviously did not. But so some of the tensions that exist in Chicago today and ever all throughout uh, American history were, were evident there. Other interesting thing is women had a very interesting role. The actual Women's Congress of, uh, Women's Congress of Representative Women was also there. So Jane Addams, uh, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton uh, were there. Bertha Palmer of Palmer House fame uh, was also there. And so uh, they, uh, they were involved in really looking at women's suffrage issues and others. So it was, it was, there's some interesting tensions there. Um, and what's amazing about this is these buildings were built in a very short period of time and then torn down immediately after, which happens to most of these fairs and relatively few buildings survive. And here's a shot of uh, the nighttime shot that I mentioned. Um, we'll get, whoops, jumped ahead again, there we go. Um, so now moving into the um, 20th century, this is the uh, century of progress. And I have a couple of video clips that will explain it best. This, this was located up on um, uh, just south, basically uh, where Meg's Field is in that area, just south of the aquarium. In fact, the aquarium you'll see in one of the shots uh, aquarium was built, I think, in 1930, and so this is just three years after the opening of the Chicago Aquarium. So let me just show you uh, a couple of short videos. Disney Plus, Hulu, and ESPN Plus. And a few ads. Together, the greatest stories, characters, the largest streaming TV library, and exclusive sports. Disney.
Chicago had a real challenge on its hands, and that was to top the great 1893 World's Columbian Exposition, the fabled White City, because Chicago wanted to create a second World's Fair to open in 1933, and this was to be the 100th anniversary of the incorporation of Chicago as a town. Now, it also had the challenge because it was the middle of the Depression. Money was tight, but Chicago persevered. They built on the lakefront of Chicago and Northerly Island, this amazing futuristic fair. It's, it's as successful as the 1893 fair, even if not more successful, because it ran for two years. It's uh, one of the last world's fairs in America to pay for itself, and pay off its bills. Century of Progress, unlike the Columbian Exposition, which was kind of backward looking to Rome and Greece and the Imperial City, was really a forward looking place. The modern buildings vastly different color. It wasn't the white city of the Columbian Exposition. There's purples and blues and oranges and yellows and golds uh, uh, were, were used to decorate these buildings. America came to the fair, the world came to the fair, and ideas were shared. So it was this very interesting cross-cultural experience. It was a look at the future, and so you will see photographs of these kind of futuristic buildings, the newest, the latest, and inventions. The photographs give us this sense of the celebration of the future, of Chicago's future um, and the future of the country, the future of the, of the Western world, the celebration of industrialization, of uh, modernization. So the car, um, car companies, the rides, the, the sky ride, um, the, the very art deco and the modern uh, tradition in the buildings are all there. This was a real really important part of the stepping stone and the evolution of um, modern industrial design certainly and car design and you know everything from you know uh, plates with a streamlined motif to your juicer to your car you have uh, the arts uh, and of course you also have uh, the sort of hoochie coochie girls right uh, the, uh, the naked dancer sally rand <laughs> But it also looked to the past. There were. I was going to cut that before Dominic uh, did his Gucci Gucci thing. Um, by the way, I think Tim Samuelson and uh, both uh, Dominic have, I think they probably presented at Curl over the years, haven't they? I believe so, yes. Uh, let me get back here. Um, this other video is a little. Um, so a little more promotional and less the historic lot historians uh, but it shows it in color it's not it's this will be a little wobbly but uh That's a shed uh, aquarium right ahead of us. A spectacular fair that was started by a beam of light from the star Arcturus. People from every corner of the world came to see its magic and its marvels. No less than 22 millions of them came swarming into this colossal show to witness the brilliant handiwork of its modern, unparalleled ingenuity. Here is the famous avenue of flags, a beautiful flag bedecked boulevard, every foot of its magnificent concourse filled with an endless stream of pleasure seekers. In gay attire, full of the holiday mood, keying their spirits to the glitter and sparkle of their surroundings, eager participants in the sweep and glory of a show unmatched in the annals of fair making. Like a sentinel commanding the sun stands the Hall of Science, saluting the waters of the shimmering lagoon. It is a typical example of the regal architecture that is to be found everywhere on the ground, creating, together with its companions, a skyline of glowing monuments to beauty. Look at this dazzling performance of architectural effort, a symphony in steel and stone and glass, a tribute to structural perfection. With its graceful lines and commanding pylons, it offers a vivid modern contrast to an age-old Maya temple nearby. These majestic records of artistic achievement are to be seen everywhere. Visitors flock by the millions to drink in their glories. 
following one upon the other, they create a picture that enthralls the eye with their sweep and majesty, a gorgeous climax to this vista of blue-green lagoons. Seen from the deck of a launch or across the rippling waters, this group makes an unforgettable impression. Visual music with chords of rainbow hues, the dream of the artist come true, the hope of design. Um, I think you get the point. And uh, I was wondering, uh, in terms of teaching a class, if you taught your class with that kind of voice the whole time, it'd be very, I'm not sure anyone could sustain that, but. Um, so you get a sense that it's clearly promoting new technology, capitalism, uh, companies, for-profit companies, all, all the kinds of uh, progress technologically. It also, th these fairs, this one, the one in New York you'll see, and also the one in the, New York in the 30s and the one in New York in the 60s, all are featuring um, companies, like they all have pavilions. So the other is, it, you know, General Motors, Ford, um, in have pavilions in both of the fairs in uh, New York and even Chicago, some of them. And then um, you have other companies like uh, in, in the 60s, IBM and others that have their pavilions. It's, it's sort of like a combination of showing off technologies, but it's a bit of amusement park, Disneyland kind of, uh, of, of uh, approach. So moving to New York World's Fair in um, a little later in the 30s, it's, uh, this is sort of the, uh, the, the emblematic, uh, it's a symbol of, of that fair, I believe it was called the Paris Fair in Trilon. And um, all the stuff had that kind of logo on it, but let me show you uh, uh, a little bit on this, another video here. Good grammar and spelling are important, but if you want to write essays that inspire, messages that forge brighter can In 1939, the New York World's Fair gave spectators a glimpse at the world of tomorrow. What was the World's Fair? What types of displays were there? Throughout the 1930s, there were many expositions and World's Fairs across the nation. One of the first occurred in Philadelphia in 1926. It was called the Sesquicentennial International Exposition and celebrated the 150th anniversary of the nation's independence. Chicago had a similar event in 1933, known as the Century of Progress Exposition. California hosted two World's Fairs. <clears throat> the first was in 1935 in San Diego, and it was known as the California Pacific Exposition. The second came in 1937 and was called the Golden Gate Exposition, with the featured attraction being the newly constructed Golden Gate Bridge. The biggest and best of the World's Fairs was the New York World's Fair, which opened on April 30th, 1939. The fair covered nearly two square miles and had several zones, including transportation, communications, food, government, community interests, and amusement. The theme of the fair was the world of tomorrow and each of these different zones displayed what the future <coughs> might look like in each respective field. For example, in the transportation zone, General Motors showed off a model city designed for cars with super highways from coast to coast and no red lights. Ford displayed some of their newest vehicle designs. In other exhibits, Fair attendees received a glimpse of television for the first time. Color photography was also on display for all to see. General Electric introduced the world to the fluorescent light bulb, and one auditorium was equipped with another new invention, air conditioning. 
Westinghouse provided the seven foot tall Electro, the Moto Man. This was a robot that could talk and perform other tasks. Meanwhile, in the communication zone, AT&T was showing off a mechanized synthetic voice that could speak to fairgoers. IBM had new devices of their own, such as the electric typewriter and an electric calculator. Aside from the many exhibits, there were also live shows featuring dancers and other forms of entertainment. The amusement zone provided a variety of rides similar to the ones found at fairs in today's world. One of the most popular rides was the parachute jump, which allowed people to experience the exhilaration of dropping from a parachute. Each day, the mayor of New York City, Fiorella LaGuardia, would roam the grounds and greet fairgoers or entertain celebrity visitors. Franklin Roosevelt visited the fair on its opening day and even officially opened the event. King George VI and Queen Elizabeth of England also visited the fair. The New York World's Fair was hugely popular. On its first day, nearly 200,000 people paid to enter the gates. By the end of the fair's existence in 1940, more than 44 million people had visited the world of tomorrow. So you can see the, um, again, it's, it's a promotional piece. It's a boosterism for cities, but also it's a boosterism for uh, companies for new technologies, cons new consumer products. And um, as I said, virtually, you know, all the major companies in uh, the United States would be, uh, have their pavilions to uh, uh, show off stuff. And often these pavilions had uh, various um, rides and, and displays. As I mentioned, this is the uh, New York World's Fair Futurama. It's interesting to someone of my generation. It's sort of interesting. I, my parents, who lived in New York at the time, would occasionally talk about the New York Fair and how exciting it was. And they went there and multiple times. And it was uh, it was a major event. But uh, it was again. You got to look at the date here. It's it's 1939. We're uh, getting out of the depression, about to enter. Um, World War II. And so things are in upheaval around the world. And uh, this is sort of producing this view of some level of, of order, future that's optimistic. Um, let me find a little more here on the Futurama. American cities have. Well, because we have that live the tape field. Oops. You, okay. Um, did you try to stop you know, <laughs> cracking up or did you have, you know, did you bite your lip or did you just kind of go with the flow? How, how did you do it yourself? We'll stop at that and we'll see if I can get that World Series thing back. American cities have fundamentally altered how they built themselves over the last 60 years. And to me, the, the place that it really started was the 1939 World's Fair. At what was the most successful World's Fair in history, the most successful exhibit was one called Futurama. To help us get a glimpse into the future of this unfinished world of ours, there has been created for the New York World's Fair a thought-provoking exhibit of the developments ahead of us. A vivid tribute to the American scheme of living. Come, let's travel into the future. What will we see? Futurama portrayed the future of the city in that distant year, 1960. The world we are now seeing is a vision, an artistic conception, which may undergo many changes as it develops into the great realities of tomorrow and it portrayed a city that was car driven lots of open spaces you could live in the country 
and drive to your job downtown, then you'd have the best of two worlds. Over space, man has begun to win victory. Suburban splendor and urban excitement. Uh, not coincidentally, Futurama was sponsored by General Motors, and they were promoting what we wanted. And it's my sense that 1939, just before the war, the clouds are looming over Europe. We go off to war, and we have this image that's mulling in our minds, and we come back, and we implement Futurama. Fifteen million GIs came back from the war, clamoring for new homes and a piece of land in the country. Almost overnight, suburbia was born. I didn't use that one because uh, the wave sequence lasted about three minutes. It's so weird. We won't show that. I don't know if you, I think there was a reference here, but uh, that the Futurama in 1939 uh, was portraying what they saw as what the world would look in 1960. Uh, so it's sort of interesting to see what existed in 1960 and uh, not quite as car centric as that. It's, uh, it's sort of stunning, but again, it's because the automobile industries uh, helped develop this and there's virtually no mention of public transportation. And there was mention about everyone having their own cars. So, and this is also uh, before, after World War II, of course, the Levittowns were built, especially around the East Coast, were basically using uh, assembly line kind of production to produce homes. Hence the one reference to developments producing, you know, one home every day in, in one of the developments, I think in Kansas City. But um, so, you know, that's the world that the, they're looking at. Now in 1964, 65 is uh, the next World's Fair in New York. This, by the way, this occupies the same space as the 1939 World's Fair. And if you look in the distance here in this uh, photograph, aerial photograph, that baseball stadium was the first baseball stadium of the New York Mets, that's Shea Stadium. Uh, there's now, it's gone to, there's different stadiums that have gone over in that place. And where the World's Fair now is, you might uh, recognize that Earth sphere. That is, um, I believe it's still there. This is now uh, Flushing Meadows where, uh, the U.S. Open tennis tournaments are held, and the whole complex is there. So it's now it's always been used for this kind of exhibition, kind of purpose. Uh, so let me show you uh, this one. Hopefully, the sound may not be as great on this, but we'll we'll see. And this is um, from the Futurama at the 1964-65 World's Fair.
Futurama 2. Welcome to a journey into the future. A journey for everyone today and to be everywhere of tomorrow. Let us explore together the future. A future not of dreams, but of reality. It is now tomorrow. On the moon, there is no air to breathe. No rain to fall. No sound that can be heard. Yet, here is man, exploring, building his first bridgehead in his span of space. Lunar rovers float magically over powdered plains, range the crater's edge, their elastic train-like bodies conforming to every surface character of the moon. Here are bases of communication and supply, islands of existence, built to withstand the melting heat of the lunar day, the shattering cold of the lunar night. Men in space now monitor the Earth, while men on Earth are finding a whole <coughs> new world of answers to the worldwide needs of man. A diamond brilliance draws us to a frozen shore, to Antarctica, the southern polar cap of the world. Here, nations of the world speaking the common language of science, probe for the Earth's secrets through countless centuries of ice. In mobile laboratories, form expeditions into the vast white wastelands of the still unknown. And here is Weather Central, forecasting to the world the great climatic changes born in the Antarctic's never-ending winds. Technicians kept warm within their walls of ice gather data from the depths of space, from polar winds, surrounding seas. In microseconds, relaying information wherever needed, anywhere on Earth. Three quarters of our Earth lies beneath the cold, still deeps of the sea. A water world in which we now can find abundance far beyond our dreams. Now we can farm and harvest a drifting, swimming, never-ending nourishment, food enough to feed seven times the population of the Earth. In aquacopters, search the ocean floor to find miles deep, vast fields of precious minerals and ores. And in the deepest trenches of the seas, study at first hand long-hidden secrets of survival. Work easily the rich oil deposits of the continental shelves, while trains of submarines transport materials and goods along the waterways of the undersea. And in warmer seas are new realms of pleasure. A weekend, if you wish, at Hotel Atlantis in the kingdom of the sea. A holiday of thrills and of adventure, of radiant wonders in the sun-bright gardens of the sea. Fabulous coral reefs lead us back to the land, an equatorial land. Now, technology has found a way to control the wild profusion of this wonder world. A jungle road is built in one continuous operation. First, a searing ray of light, the laser beam, cuts through the trees. Then, a giant machine, a factory on wheels, grinds up the stumps and jungle growth, sets the firm foundation, forms the surface slabs, sets them in place, and the roadway bed is paved. These forest highways now are bringing to the innermost depths of the tropic world the goods and materials of progress and prosperity creating productive communities that can enter profitably the markets of the world and offering to us all enchanting tours through the storybook forests of tropic lands. The mountain barrier, legendary challenge of man, now invites communal living in a world of awesome beauty. A new system of highways spans the continents to transport men and goods swiftly and separately across the land. And for our deserts, 
A new technology. Waters from the sea made fresh as rain to nourish crops planted in the sand. Produce from seed to shipment programmed and processed by a new agriculture. A science of plenty for an ever-growing world. People live today where they will. Neither terrain nor distance a deterrent to where the men of the city build their homes. All roads lead, as they have for centuries, to the great centers of commerce and communication, as the Continental Highway now leads us to the city of tomorrow. Plazas of urban living rise over freeways. Vehicles, electronically paced, travel routes remarkably safe, swift, and efficient. Towering terminals serve sections of the city, make public transportation more convenient provide ample space for private cars, and from the lower levels, covered moving walks radiate to shopping areas that are now truly marketplaces of the world. Its traditions and its faiths preserved, there is new beauty and new strength in the city of tomorrow. Technology can point the way to a future of limitless promise. But man must chart his own course into tomorrow. A course that frees the mind and the spirit as it improves the well-being of mankind. I hope you enjoyed that, Rod. Uh, it's, um, that's one of the more remarkable film clips. Um, I just think it, it's sort of like an exploitation film of uh, humans exploiting the nature around them. I was thinking, uh, you talk about exploiting the ocean and that, which is now warming, exploiting the polar caps, which are now melting, exploiting the Amazon, which is now burning and disappearing. Um, there was a movie by John Sayles a number of uh, years ago called Orange County, in which at one point there's a scene with a uh, developer of golf courses Sound, sound familiar, um, developer of golf courses who looked around this, uh, what had been swampy area in Florida and uh, said, I like to think of my development as nature on a leash. And um, that clip we just saw has a lot more than nature on a leash. It's like total uh, elimination of it. But anyway, we'll talk about that later. Um, okay. So the World's Fair didn't occur without its controversies. The beginning of this World's Fair, um, there was for two days, various civil rights organizations, Congress for Racial Equality, NAACP, among others, were at organized, first they, well, they had organized uh, car, um, car stoppages. So the major roads going into uh, the World's Fair the first couple of days, uh, were sporadic uh, shutdowns. They had cars breaking down. Um, in fact, if you think about it, probably most metro areas, uh, about a dozen well-placed cars can totally shut down the uh, a metro area for probably a good part of a day. And also there were demonstrators that went in and uh, picketed many of the pavilions because most of the employers at the, uh, that had pavilions were uh, had discriminatory hiring practices. And there was... Uh, you know, poor wages, all uh, lousy working conditions, and um, just a little uh, family uh, uh, autobiographical uh, view. This is one demonstrator uh, at the fair who was, uh, I think at that point, the, maybe the head of the Columbia University Congress of Racial Equality. That's uh, my brother, uh, quite a number of years ago. And um, I have to say too, this, this World's Fair, uh, I was, I, I went to it probably 15 times. I was the unofficial uh, tour guide for people visiting us and everyone would want to go see the fair. So it was a, a big attraction. Okay, enough of the fairs. We can talk about that a little more. Just want to put a couple things in context, another maybe 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes, and then uh, we can talk about some more things. Um, is thinking about the, just the future cities of where they are, what's growing, where it is, is the, worldwide growth of urbanized areas is the heavy growth is outside the US and 
and um, uh, Western Europe. And if you look at just the, this growth over time in these, it looks like um, sort of a genetic uh, map or something, but uh, from 1950 current day and projection to uh, 2050, and uh, the percent of the world is urban, while the US and Western Europe are heavily urbanized, uh, it's not so much the case of the whole, has been so much the case of the whole world, but it is becoming. So, you know, Africa, Asia, Latin America <clears throat> are clearly uh, seeing massive growth. And the city sizes in these places are far greater than we see in this country. In fact, New York doesn't make the top 10 of uh, world cities in terms of population ranking. So uh, Chicago's, you know, 8 million plus uh, doesn't compare in the metro area doesn't compare with uh, Tokyo's 37 million, there were Delhi's 30 million, um, Mexico City's 21 million, and those are still growing, although some of the growth of these international cities is starting to level off a bit. It's not quite at the same rate it was years ago. So I just wanted to, looking at uh, the future of cities, I just want to look at a few dimensions that are related to some of the things going on now, and we can talk about more is first of all, looking at views ahead from inside the pandemic, because clearly this is a major impact on how we look ahead and it, it's caused some changes. I think it's, it's accelerated others. Many of the things we're experiencing now are uh, things that were already trends, but now it's, it's sped it up considerably. Uh, looking at how built environment and social worlds are, uh, have changed, maybe changing, uh, looking, we have shrinking city centers, continuing sprawl, uh, the changing patterns of work and family or home and commuting to offices, to, to, to distant offices, uh, looking at uh, racial, ethnic, social class segregation, new retail worlds, even within our country, I'm focusing now in the US, of urban rural divides and north south uh, urban political divides as well. And these are obviously factors that are going to shape uh, the future city. Uh, this is uh, looking at the future cities after the pandemic. Well, this is the 1918 influenza uh, pandemic. And this is an infamous, uh, on the upper left there, the infamous parade uh, took place in Philadelphia in, I believe, September 1918, uh, against the advice of certain health leaders, because Boston at this point was also already being devastated by the flu. Uh, Philadelphia went ahead and did, I think, 200,000 people attended this. It's, it was for uh, promoting victory bonds people for people to purchase those in support of uh, the war effort, World War I war, war effort. And within literally days, just a few days, people started coming down with the flu and dying. I mean, there are a few thousand that died within less than a week of this. Um, and also, as people probably know already, because there's been lots of information on this, that uh, the, the 2018 pandemic worldwide had uh, hit heavily younger people. So the, the group that was hit the hardest was, I think, roughly 18 to 30 years old. So people sort of in their primes or, or just developing, quite honestly, uh, careers and families and whatnot, were the ones who are most vulnerable to this, which is uh, quite interesting. Um, and just as today, uh, there are issues about more aggressive interventions with um, mitigation of the effects of the flu. So this is from uh, looking at, this is manufacturing data and uh, comparing the experience of uh, cities <clears throat> that were really strict and ones that weren't strict with uh, in, in intervening in terms of masks, shutting theaters down, schools down, uh, sounds familiar. And so shorter, longer, and the how we bounce back from this. So St. Paul and Minneapolis are two that are good examples of uh, St. Paul had minimal interventions and right next door in Minneapolis they had fairly strict interventions and Minneapolis bounced back faster after this uh, basically during after after 1919. Similarly San Francisco didn't make as many uh, mitigation efforts as did LA and uh, there's significant differences there. Not that this, well we don't know yet but um, given the debate this data from 100 years ago 
does sort of indicate that uh, early aggressive mitigation makes sense. And then um, looking at issues of deaths, uh, even more important than the economy there, is uh, you had higher deaths in those cities that did less in mitigation than others. And so that remains to be seen how it's gonna play out. Unfortunately, right now we're clearly experiencing a major new uptick in the virus as a number of experts had been predicting. Uh, so that remains to be seen what happens, but it's certainly playing out as we speak. Um, and this is an illustration of uh, in Europe, which has been hard hit with this third round, third um, big bump, was uh, announced, I guess, a city lot wide lockdown and uh, of Paris. And so Paris, this is the day that I think just before the shutdown is going to, lockdown is going to take place of people leaving Paris and exiting and jamming the roads to get out of Paris. So I wanted to talk about just a little bit about uh, changing consumer patterns in the future of cities. Uh, part of discussion always is that Amazon versus brick and mortar retail and, and what this means for the future. And it's, well, I'll show you the next, yeah, that's on the next slide. And there's sort of this anti-Amazon uh, view of some sorts. I'm not a spokesperson for Amazon. It's a massive company and there's issues to that. But um, just looking at how much our brick and mortar retail has been overbuilt. This is, um, this is the square footage of, uh, I just forgot, let's see what GLA was. Uh, um, just lost track of that. But basically it's it's about a square footage you have of shopping malls to population. Um, and the, the, the footage you have, space you have in shopping malls per capita. US is mass and Canada a lesser extent, but US is massively different than other uh, country, Western European countries where you know five, six times, seven times um, the amount of space taken up on retail. So we have overbuilt uh, retail and a lot of this started shrinking after the 08 uh, economic, 08, 09 economic downturn. Uh, people now refer to as the uh, death of malls and uh, saying that it's quite, there's something like 1200 major malls in the US that, that were back in well, actually 2017. And the projection is in, in the not too distant future, there'll probably be 900 and probably even less given what's happened. The, the prediction of 900 was made before the pandemic, which I think has just sped up some of the process. But also given this you know, the idea of, oh, Amazon's wrecking our economy, changing our social worlds. It, it, there's a bit of irony when it comes to Chicago. These are two companies that were uh, present and started in Chicago as Sears and Roebuck and Montgomery Wards, both of them this is late 19th century, developed a catalog business. So the idea was, oh, you can't get, uh, you know, there's, there's stores out West that there's now the frontier is developing and Western, Western Mississippi is developing as is the rest of the country. And uh, people need stuff, but the small stores, the retail infrastructure is not providing what's needed. We'll have a catalog and we'll ship, we'll mail things uh, to them. So uh, think as, uh, think of a, a Sears catalog as, uh, uh, a paper internet, basically. And so here you have this very successful business for decades and decades. And um, it was addressing similar issues. So you have this growth of a major employment, major uh, uh, presence in Chicago. And this, uh, that building on the right is in what now is Central Station, the south part of the loop. And that was, uh, I don't know if that building still there, might be but it's probably converted into uh, condos. It's um, Reuben Donnelly, it's r, r Donnelly, which is a company that, that printed catalogs, magazines, and they were doing very well at the time. This you may be familiar with, this is Montgomery Ward's old uh, biz, uh, basic warehouses where they shipped from. This is all on the North Branch Chicago River, just north of Chicago Avenue. That building, the high rise building to the right, the modern building is was their modern corporate headquarters before um, basically they went bankrupt. Uh, I can't remember how many, maybe 
15 plus years ago, 20 years ago. And uh, this is uh, Chicago Avenue and maybe Clark. Uh, this is their original Montgomery Ward administration building in 1929. So Chicago has played a role in, in, in much of this in, in the future. The other thing though, now looking at the um, pandemic and possibly the restructuring of, down, of downtown Chicago and all other downtowns, where fewer and fewer people are going in, maybe more people stay at home and do work, or it's more of a hybrid mix that we start seeing, is the impact it's gonna have on employment. Uh, this is someone commenting from, uh, as a, a writer for the Atlantic Magazine, that, um, uh, that Amazon and its kin, is quoting from him, moved work out of brick and mortar shops. Uh, what the e-commerce revolution did for physical stores the telepresence revolution could do for office adjacent employment, put downward pressure on laborers who serve white collar workers uh, when they leave the house. Uh, there are a lot of those, and the it estimates roughly 30 million Americans work in restaurants, transportation, and buildings and grounds maintenance directly connected to serving uh, businesses that uh, are related to the workplace. And so that's changing as we speak. And a lot of this, unfortunately, is not going to. Um, um, change or, or rapidly. And, and finally, one other point I wanted to make apropos to today is, is really looking at changing character of urban, rural, and north-south political divide in the U.S., uh, which has been topic of news headlines for days now. And uh, but looking at just the urban population, half the U.S. population lives in the 39 largest metro areas. And, uh, you know, you see the maps, mapping is interesting, but it, it looks like there's hardly anything urban when in fact, this is all concentrated. So uh, all the gray area is, uh, you know, is more, uh, is less, much, much less densely populated. It's more rural. And looking at the trends, everyone knows this, but uh, you have uh, urban versus rural in the uh, US and that you have this, this split in, in 1920 is about 50 50 and, and now it's, uh, it's barely 20 percent of the u.s population living in rural locations and so it'll be interesting to see what happens with this it's not that people are going to move to the country but uh and this also relates to things like sprawl which is seen as a bad thing but the decentralization we don't know maybe the the, the shrinkage of downtowns may not support far out uh towns and, and uh, small cities, but may, you know, maybe suburbs will get enhanced or we don't know what this is going to look like exactly. The other thing I want to just briefly touch on, it's interesting in light of uh, recent politics, is um, the, uh, what, what is best described now as the blue migration. So this blue migration, uh, let me again read from another uh, it's the same author from The Atlantic and another article. He says, in, in many ways, uh, Chicago's problems are like a canary in the, in the metropolitan coal mine. Immigration to the area, to Chicago, has declined in half since the early 2000s. High earners have swarmed the Chicago riverbanks, revitalizing the downtown area. But the more diverse middle class, especially the city's African-American population, is evacuating Chicago's suburbs, evacuating the suburbs, uh, during the great migration of the of 20th century, when millions of Black Americans moved to northern cities, the population of Chicago went from 4% Black in 1920 to nearly 40% Black in 1990. But this century, the 21st century, has seen a reverse great migration as the metro Black population is on pace to half, have, uh, from its peak of 1.2 million at 2030, uh, by 2030, uh, this could reflect a flight from high crime neighborhoods and the racist legacy of redlining throughout Chicagoland. Less pessimistically, uh, it might be a sign a lot of young black families would just rather live where they can afford more house, like the suburbs of Atlanta and Houston. And um, which is, uh, this is showing the, it, it's domestic immigration into Chicago, which basically says, since it's all negative, it's not immigration, it's leaving. And this is just gives a little example of where they're moving to. So domestic immigration to Phoenix, Dallas, and Las Vegas is, is going up. And what's interesting about this apropos, well, I'll do one more here. Um, 
is looking at uh, our current Democratic, Republican, red, blue state business is you have uh, voting margins by metro areas. And, and what's happening is this great migration, not just African-Americans, but others, folks that are moving to Southern towns. The trend we've seen, for example, the research triangle in North Carolina um, is uh, one example where a lot of Midwesterners, Northerners have moved workforce-wise and have changed the political lay of the land in North Carolina. And the massive growth of Atlanta from uh, domestic migration is showing that, in fact, um, it looks like Biden now has a, a very slight lead there, but just the fact that the Democrats have made inroads is interesting. And what's also been happening in Texas, although it'd be interesting to look at Texas State a little more, but the point is Texas is seeing more Democrats uh, voting. This is, I mean, it's always had a base there, but uh, some of this is coming from out of the state. So for example, when Beto O'Rourke ran for Senate, um, his, even though he failed, the young voters, I think the 20-something the voters voted uh, 60, no, no, I'm sorry. The, um, the voters, voters who had moved from out of Texas um, into Texas in the previous 10 years to that election, 60% uh, of those supported O'Rourke. So there's a bias there to some of those folks moving in. Uh, so it, it'll be interesting to see uh, where this goes. And I guess one one final thing I'd say before we, we talk is as much as I haven't talked about CURL projects directly, that basically what CURL does, what it has done for literally decades now, is represents a shaping of the future. It, we shouldn't think of the future as something that's uh, determined by technology and some other forces are determining it, that basically virtually all our projects have something to do with uh, equity, social justice, and has to do with building the capacity of whether it be organizations, uh, social movements, uh, increase the effectiveness, efficiencies of these places uh, to bring about change, whether it's you know shaping and reducing uh, uh, sexual violence, healthcare, immigrant rights, racial equity, children's health, uh, looking at housing rights. I was struck recently uh, just in the, um, the past uh, couple of weeks, New York Times ran a, an article written by um, Matthew Desmond to all of you sociologists out there, uh, wrote the book Evicted. And uh, he was talking about uh, some of the, what's been happening with homeless people that have taken, that there were squatters in I think five houses in, in, uh, in, in Minneapolis. And over time and through their work, they've now are, uh, or it looked like they were taking over and getting ownership of some of these, these houses. And it's not that dissimilar project that I was involved in as Curl was starting over 20 years ago, uh, working with organization in Northeast and now one Northside on um, 10 buildings in Uptown where tenants were basically trying to take more control of those buildings. So these are positive things and movements that are affecting social justice issues. And um, we, we don't want to lose sight of those in the midst of all the the celebration of technologies and, and even the, the woe is me kind of work about how things are getting so much worse that we're actually doing things that are improving things. On that note, I will uh, open up to, to questions and comments. Great. Thank you, Phil. That was fantastic. Um, and if you want to stop sharing your screen, you should be able sure. to see everybody. So yeah, so if anybody has any questions, um, please feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. And if you could please also introduce yourselves so we know um, either where you're from in the university or outside of the university, uh, just to give yourself a little context, that would be great. And I did get a chat from Rich Norman. I think that you had a question. Do you want me to read uh, your chat or would you like to go ahead and ask? Yeah, okay, I can ask. Uh, uh, I live in uh, Edgewater here in Chicago. And uh, I was just uh, 
asking uh, if there, if you could comment on the contributions to city development of uh, people like in Chicago, Daniel Burnham, and people like uh, Robert Moses in New York. Uh, interesting. So it, it, Burnham has had a major, had a major impact on uh, Chicago for sure, in shaping Chicago. There's no question about it. And uh, it, it's, I think, having grown up it, or in the New York area, and still around there till I was in my, you know, maybe about twenty. Robert Moses also had impact, although he had a much more uh, um, dictatorial view on some circles. And uh, if you read Jane Jacobs' um, sort of classic books, Death and the Life of Great American Cities, she, Jane Jacobs was a, a major opponent of various projects that Moses was, was considering. In, in some ways, those, those World's Fairs, uh, I, I think he was also involved in 1964 World's Fair. Uh, the world's fair view of, of the car and roads or something so sort of very Moses kind of oriented of planning. I think uh, Burnham was, he didn't live in the sort of the automobile age as much. And I think was a little more integrative of, of, of sort of the, the lake, the, the city and uh, has a more positive view, but uh, you know, they both clearly had massive impacts on, uh, on their respective cities. I had a, a question, if I can jump in. Um, yeah, hi, hi, Phil, thanks for this. This was this was really interesting um, and I enjoyed it. I, uh, so I'm Peter Rosenblatt, I'm a, a professor in the sociology department. And I was just wondering if you'd sort of come across anything or th about climate change and, and ways yeah. of thinking about that in the, the future. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it seems like, what I've seen leans more towards sort of technology mm -hmm. solutions, but maybe some design things. I just wondered if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, when I was looking through, uh, I, it was one of those things where I, <laughs> it, it's sort of the antithesis of that uh, video that was with the Futurama of the, the 1960s World's Fair, which is like, our idea is you're just gonna plow over, you know, the Amazon rainforest and uh, we're gonna just sell everything. and. Uh, it was sort of remarkable. Yes, there's a lot of, uh, clearly I was looking through, and I didn't include it just because there's a matter of time, but the environmental movement is, is significant in terms of how cities get shaped and may, may, can feed to some extent, I think this idea that maybe ur big urban downtowns are gonna shrink. We have something like, well, it's horrible, but uh, may, maybe not. And uh, that there's also been discussion of, especially in the context of the pandemic, that to what extent has the degradation of the broader environment increased the potential for more pandemics and for more problematic things? I mean, there, as much as one might not think of the connection is with, as we push into areas of natural, relatively undisturbed places, the, the potential of stirring up things like um, the, the coronavirus that we now have uh, around us and um, Ebola is, is a perfect example too, where luckily we were able to stop that from moving far out of Africa at that point. But uh, so yeah, it, I think it's it's a significant issue. And uh, I think if even things like increasing efficiency. So I mean, one, I think another thing that, that sort of running at counter purposes is thinking about this urban area and the idea of downtown, public transportation, everyone is in one area as a more efficient way of living. So if you look at energy use, for example, New York's Manhattan is more, among the more efficient places. Uh, it moves a lot of people around. On the other hand, you have this, I mean, every block in New York, I mean, might have 100,000 people living on a city block. And uh, well, it might be efficient, it, they're, that runs in the potential problems as well, just health-wise and, and others. So it, it's absolutely there. And I think it's uh, um, a significant issue that I didn't address, but it, it's absolutely there. And I think that in, in, a, in a certain cynical way, I was using that uh, 1960s video to show what a failure of all these uh, you know, things. Again, the ocean's warming, those polar caps are melting, the, the Amazon's burning. And uh, so how is that progress that you're projecting? 
Hi, I have a hey. question. Oh wait, was somebody else talking? Oh, I was gonna, Gwendolyn has her hand up and then Carter oh. will go to you. Yeah, I'll wait. Uh, good morning, uh, I'm, I'm actually an alum from Loyola and Dr. Nyden was on my dissertation committee. Hey, Gwendolyn. How are you? Hey. Uh, my hair has conditioner on it, so that's why y'all can't see me. <laughs> y'all need to see all that. But what we're looking for the uh, presentation is really interesting. And so I'm wondering, how, uh, have you given thought when you talk about our shrinking cities and even, uh, as you mentioned, with uh, the impact that COVID um, has had, have you thought about like if the downtown areas shrink, like how transportation might um, right. be impacted? Um, by that, uh, especially as we look at different types of urban uh, sprawl where transportation is not necessarily built to support it, not public transportation, but uh, highways are in various uh, cities. But what happens with uh, the transit systems if, if downtowns are shrinking? Right. No, I mean, that's one of those issues. Absolutely. Where, you know, it's public transportation is is a much more efficient way of moving people around. <clears throat> around. I mean, if you start decentralizing people, you get some way more complex, not only providing transportation, but even thinking about healthcare and other things. You, know, you have to build more hospitals that get closer to people and emergencies. I mean, that, that has, I mean, there's, there's efficiencies to concentration. And um, it, it's also one of those issues given, and I didn't address it, you know, specifically, but if you think of the current pandemic and who's impacted and this proportionate impact on African-American communities, Latino communities, um, and especially urban African-American and, and uh, I mean, central city African-American and Latino communities. And it's almost like, oh, we're gonna leave town. And it's like, wait, wait a minute, you know, there's a need to, to address inequities there as well. And it's, uh, in some ways one would, should, would argue that the concentration makes providing healthcare better. But getting back to the public transportation piece, yeah, I think it is an issue because right now, uh, the, the real danger, we have various public transportation systems in Chicago, but also in other cities that are at well below bankruptcy uh, functioning right now. They've always been struggling and uh, given certain political influences of not wanting to give them too much money or subsidies. But uh, they're now not used as heavily as they have been and should be, but people have legitimate fears of, of driving on them. So it's unclear where that's going to go. And if you decentralize, it's not going to get that better. And it's just harder to move people around. So um, I don't have a great answer for that, but I think it's one that has to be addressed. And I, I think the one thing that's lacking in all of those uh, World's Fair kind of projections was more efficient public transportation and uh, more comfortable ways of moving people around. And, and also, as you know, this country is, is really behind parts of the world. If you go to Asian countries, to Europe, Western Europe, even African countries, the, the, uh, the quality of public transportation in some areas of the bigger cities is, is far superior to what we have. So um, yes, it, it's important. Plus, it, it also helps uh, address issues of inequity. If you have quality public transportation systems, it reduces one of those imbalances we have of where people have to afford, have to have a car to get places and, and spend an enormous amount of money on transportation when they shouldn't have to. Uh, thank you. Yeah, because I do think that it will be a continued issue as people don't want to give more money as they're using more ride share and, and moving out into other areas. Um, less likely to even want to support a solid public transit um, infrastructure. So thank you. Yeah, and also just on that too, I think there's also this conceptualization of, you just think of employers, well, some employers are more informed than others, but the idea that, well, we don't want to pay for that. That's not our problem of, of uh, transportation. Well, of course it is a, a, an employer issue, uh, a problem, uh, because they have to get workers from their home to the workplace. And, you know, it's like they pay for their elevator, right? So why don't they pay for the bus and trying to get the people to the bottom of that elevator. Same problem. Thank you. My turn? Sure, Carter, go ahead. Um, hi. hi, everyone. My name is Carter. Uh, uh, I did my bachelor at Loyola for environmental science, and now I'm working on a master of public policy uh, with Annette, actually. Uh, she's my counselor. 
and not Steinecker. And um, so the short question I have is, do you think there will be any more world fairs? Um, <laughs> and the reason kind of why I asked this is going off of environmental science and policy is um, with the shrinking downtown and with the idea that the whole first world fairs were about like progress industry, pretty much supported by capitalism. Um, do you think that the shrinking downtowns and maybe more realized concerns with uh, the public transit problem that we're now facing, um, do you think that there would be both literal space as well as like an effective space for communication to maybe readdress mm -hmm. aims of the nation with that? Or do you think it wouldn't be worth the cost considering all the other problems that Chicago or any other country would be experiencing? Mm -hmm. And any other thoughts you have on that? Sure. Um, on the World's Fairs, I mean, they're, they're, they've been recently, I think, what they're saying that basically that 1933 century of progress may have been the last time they made money on a world's fair. They've lost money since, and they're colossal losers of money. In fact, there was a battle uh, in the 1980s in Chicago. There was going to be a world's fair in Chicago, I believe. And uh, so there were certain companies promoting that, and um, it was stopped finally. Uh, Harold Washington, it, was, it might have been before he was mayor, and he basically nixed it. So uh, not having a world fair in Chicago was a uh, was a plus and, and saved a ton of money. Um, and no, I so I think you'll see fewer of those, and you'll have you know there might be exhibitions and, and other things, but maybe not that. And in terms of the uh, you know what do you do with new space? I mean the thing is there are some things that do drive centralization, and there are cultural institutions that are important and. Uh, identity of a city often, like thing in Chicago, you know, all these downtown cultural institutions, shopping less so, I mean, and, but that's changing everywhere. And so, you know, how is that going to uh, morph? But um, especially with the pandemic, when they, you know, you, you can't go to baseball games, you can't go to um, movies, you can't go to plays, you can't go to, you know, concerts. Um, I just did a, a Zoom concert uh, the Chicago Blues Theater. It was very nice, and it was a nice be able to do it from home. And it was as interactive as one might get, but it's uh, it wasn't the same as being in uh, with uh, 150 other people in a small theater. So yeah, I think that still remains to be seen how, how that shaped. And I don't think you can decentralize some of the stuff effectively. So I think there might be some innovative ways of looking at space. And you know, it's not like everyone's going to empty out of downtown. Mm -hmm. Right. So, Jim, so uh, Dennis Marino with IFF. Um, thank you, Phil. Hey, good to see you and everyone else. Uh, so, Jimmy Carter developed a very detailed uh, national urban policy strategy and a national neighborhood commission. Uh, is your feeling Joe Biden should do something like that? There hasn't been much, certainly, there have been many programs and funding, but there hasn't been an overarching policy strategy for a long time since Carter. Yeah, I think that would be. Um, seeing something like that that really is looking at this capacity building and in some ways i don't know if biden is going to pull it off there's still a lot of static between now and inauguration day and uh a lot of there's still issues like do you really control congress and all those kind of political questions uh, but absolutely i think it's almost like a a new deal approach to lots of things and and big projects think big uh, uh no small ideas uh approach to things and i i think if focusing on neighborhoods, neighborhood capacity, it, it sort of puts some its self-interest out there. But I think, in a way, and and I think the Carter idea and, and others have it been. It's not self-interest so much as you know your neighborhood identity and connecting, but connecting to everyone around you, kind of thing. And that's that was the or that was a way to organize. I mean, you can't even think of political organizing. You don't. You, you can't organize with you know, just ads at the national level, you need to actually go door to door and talk to people. And, and uh, you know, that those kind of, that kind of organizing activity. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of space for that. And that would be uh, reinvigorating. And I think also politically wise for the new administration, because that's one way I think you might be able to start uh, in a talk about healing differences. And I quite honestly, um, there's certain Republicans I don't really care much about here. I don't think there's any healing to go on between uh, 
me and them or us and them, but there's a whole, there's millions of other people that would prefer that because they live and they have neighbors and they work together and that's important. And uh, if we can move into really doing something concrete, that would be a big, big positive. Great, thanks Phil. <laughs> Any other I'd questions? I'd like to ask a question, yes. Um, I'd like to ask, it, it seems, my impression is anyway that uh, pre, uh, you know, 19th century and uh, earlier uh, cities were developing more vertically and it seems like post-World War II cities seems to be, seem to be developing more horizontally uh, do you think that that trend will continue or, uh, you know, the, I'm just curious as the, when you put up that slide on the development of the recent, more recent cities, uh, are they more horizontal or more vertical in their development? So, I mean, I, I haven't, I'm not an expert on world cities, but I think a lot like Shanghai um, it would be very vertical. I mean, there's whether well, some lower level, uh, areas, but that it's uh, they it, there's high concentrations of population, and it, it's moved more vertically. So I think that yeah, there is that kind of development going on, and it's um, again it's an efficient use of space. In fact, it has if it's done right, it it can have density is not bad if it is connected to let's say green bands or green zones or whatnot, or you think of like in the US city, like uh, Portland, for example, has, has green bands around it that can't be developed. And while Portland's not exactly a big high rise dense city, that kind of idea, and even goes back to um, some of the, the garden city views in, in the UK, in England years ago, but you need to look at development with a mixture of this kind of stuff. So. I think high rises can be positive as long as you have, you don't just plunk, you know, square miles and square miles and square miles of them around. Yeah, because I, I live in uh, on Sheridan Road in that the strip from Hollywood to to where Sheridan makes it uh, wow. north to you know West Journey uh, by Loyola, mm -hmm. and uh, you know so, somewhat. Although I did previously, I, I had a house uh, on the north side of Chicago. I'm a lifelong Chicago residents. So, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I, I was just thinking about, you know, these areas like Phoenix and uh, San Antonio. And all. I think it's Austin. Uh, when I was down there one time, they had a, a ring of uh, sort of express how we have 294 that goes around Chicago, mm -hmm. not all the way, not a circle because of the lake, but they have a circle. And then they have another ring of, of expressways sure. beyond that. Right. <laughs> you know, and it just seemed to be more like it's like a sprawling as opposed to right. No, this, this sprawl is a is a major. And same with Phoenix. You know, right. Phoenix right. seems right. to be, and even at Las Vegas, you know, you look at all those, uh, they just seem to be like just spreading out. Right. No, I think it's uh, that is a sprawl has been a major issue urban planners in this country um, since. Well, easily mid mid twentieth century. Uh, that I mean, post World War Two, I think, really. Yeah, is, I mean, yeah. The, the you end have, of interstate. Right, and Levittown. Yeah, and interstates. In fact, when th those uh, those, those the, the, uh, exhibits from the nineteen sixties in sixty four sixty five, the interstates are still being constructed at that point. So that there are, um, as a, a kid, I could remember, you know, the interstate through it being built and those kinds of things. And we, we take it for granted, or look at Chicago. I mean, the swaths of Chicago that were uh, sort of torn down to make way for- Yes, I, where I lived uh, on the Northwest side, I lived on the West side of the Northwestern Railroad tracks and, was, and the Kennedy was on the East side. And I had many of my uh, classmates from uh, elementary school were displaced. Right. Yeah, we, we tend to lose sight of that and what kind of what we how we've ripped apart cities in the past. What do you think about like the redevelopment of uh, the area? If you I don't know if you're familiar where U.S. Steel used to be. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I actually I worked a summer at U.S. Steel before I started at Loyola, and uh, you know now that's all gone. Sure. And sure. but 
it's just sort of like, like laying there. I know there's a lot of environmental issues uh, with that area, but that, that seems to be like prime realist because it's right on the water. It is, and we built, I mean, they put that extension of Lakeshore Drive down there, and uh, right. it's, um, <laughs> the question is, Chicago, but Chicago's economy, they were doing that same time Chicago's economy was sort of shrinking. I mean, it's still good, but Chicago has been losing population. That's, um, it's not as healthy as the southern cities. And so uh, remains to be seen what happens to that. I, I, my, my primary reaction to that is I, I came out to Chicago because of the steel industry. I was doing my dissertation on the rank and file reform movement of the Steelworkers Union. So I lived in East Chicago and Hammond for four years before I uh, got the job at Loyola. And um, all I can remember is, I mean, at that point, Southworks is still very active. Uh, was, I worked there in 66, so. Okay, yeah. And, uh, but I remember someone showing someone, uh, actually they're from England, from an industrial town in England. It just, we went by right around the time they pretty much had shut down most of the mills. So you had this totally empty, massive area. And he said, this is really sad. I mean, as much as that was polluting and it was dirty and noisy and all that, <laughs> It, pro it provided employment for tens of thousands of people, that and all the other steel mills that have since shrunk or disappeared. Yeah, so it, it remains to be seen what, what that looks like. Any final questions? We're at about time. All right, well, thank you, Phil. This has been fantastic. Um, and I wanted to thank everybody for coming. Thank you for inviting me and it was good to see everyone and uh, keep well, everyone. <laughs>